Welcome back to another episode of Road to William. Today's video, we're focusing on Audrey Lord. Audrey Lord. I'm going to keep it a buck. I came across her through Queen Latifah's story on Instagram. Let's keep it honest. Let's keep it real. Let's keep it a buck. It was a few weeks ago, and she was talking about <laughs> different Black queer people you should um, look into that gets overlooked sometimes. So one of them was Audre Lord, and so I decided let's learn about her together. Let's get into it. Audre Lord, a self-described Black lesbian mother warrior poet, Audre Lord dedicated both her life and her creative talent to confronting and addressing injustices of racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia. Lord was born in New York City to West Indian immigrant parents. She attended Catholic school before graduating from Hunter High School and published her first poem in Seventeen magazine. Of her poetic beginnings, Lord commented in Black women writers, I used to speak in poetry. I would read poems and I would memorize them. People would say, well, what do you think, Audrey? What happened to you yesterday? And I would recite a poem and somewhere in that poem would be a line or a feeling I would be sharing. In other words, I literally communicated through poetry. And when I couldn't find the poems to express the things I was feeling, that's what started me writing poetry. And that was when I was 12 or 13. Lord earned her BA from Hunter College and MLS from Columbia University. She was a librarian in the New York public schools throughout the 1960s. She had two children with her husband, Edwin Rollins, a white gay man, before they divorced in 1970. In 1972, Lord met her longtime partner, Frances Clayton. In an African naming ceremony before her death, she took the name Gamba Adisa, which means warrior, she who makes her meaning known. Lord challenged the myths and taboos associated with Black women, lesbians, and feminists. Let me know what your favorite book is. I want to see which one. I'm going to start reading. What do y'all think I should start with? I'm going to start reading hers as well as Bell Hooks. I ran with, we knew we were outsiders. We knew we were outside the pale. Lived in a village. We were outsiders. We were dykes, right? A lot of us were artists. We hated typing, <laughs> right? We didn't want straight jobs. Whatever we did, we were at the fringe. Now, this, of course, was the 50s. It was like the um, the gay girls' version of the beatniks. You have to remember that the lesbian gay girls, because that's what we would call the gay girls' population, was a reflection of what else was going on, right, around us. And that was the era of, let's pretend this is the best of all possible worlds. This is exactly what we choose, right? This is it. So, like, nobody talked about racism. Right. So if something happened to me in a bar, I couldn't count on anybody standing up and covering my back. A white lesbian would not stand up to cover my back. They may say, personally, oh, isn't that too bad it happened to you? But not, hey, this shouldn't happen, period. You need to begin with a movement, which is what Black Power and the Civil Rights Movement was. Then, immediately within it, you are going to get those people whose differences are not being articulated, which is, right, us. So then there is immediately another step. How do you promise Black studies? I wish there were more Black people here to hear it. This poem comes out of the experience of really beginning to center in on what Black studies are all about. Perhaps what any study of who we are is all about. The first part. A chilled wind sweeps the high places. On the ground I watch bearers of wood carved in the image of old and mistaken gods labor in search of weapons against the blind dancers who balance great dolls upon their shoulders as they scramble over the same earth searching for food. In a room on the 17th floor, my spirit is choosing. I am afraid of speaking. Truth. In a room on the 17th floor, my body is dreaming. It sits bottom pinned to a table, eating perpetual watermelon inside my own head. 
while young girls assault my door with curse rags, stiff with their mother's old secrets, covering up their new promise with old desires, no longer their need, with old satisfactions they never enjoyed. Outside my door, they are waiting with questions that feel like judgments when they are unanswered. The palms of my hands have black marks running across them. So are signed the makers of myth who are sworn through our blood to give legends. Children will come to understand, to speak out living words like this poem that knits truth into fable, to leave my story behind Though I fall through cold wind, condemned to nursing old gods for a new heart, debtless and without color, while my flesh is covered by mouths whose noise keep my real wants secret. I do not want to lie. I have loved other tall young women deep in their color, who now crawl over a bleached earth bent into question marks, ending a sentence of men who pretended to be brave. Even this can be an idle defense, protecting lies I am trying to reject. But I am afraid that the mouths I feed will turn against me, will refuse to swallow in the silence I am warning them to avoid. I am afraid they will kernel me out like a walnut, extract the nourishing seed as my husk stains their lips with the mixed colors of my pain. While I sit, choosing a voice in which my children hear my prayers above the wind, they will follow the black roads out of my hands unencumbered by the weight of my guilty secrets, unencumbered by the weight of my remembered sorrows. They will use my legends to shape their own language and make it ruler, measuring the distance between my hungers and their own purpose. I am afraid that they will discard my most ancient nightmares where the fallen gods became demons instead of dust. Just before light, devils woke me, <laughs> trampling my flesh into fruit that would burst in the sun, until I came to despise every evening, fearing strange gods at the fall of each night. And when my mother punished me by sending me to bed without my prayers, I had no names for darkness. I do not know whose words protected me, whose tales or tears prepared me for this trial on the 17th floor. I do not know whose legends blew through my mother's furies, but somehow they fell through my sleeping lips like the juice of forbidden melons, and the little black seeds were sown throughout my heart like closed and waiting eyes. And although demons rode me until I rose up a child of mourning, deep roads sprouted over the palms of my hidden fists, dark and... I always feel a thrill of anticipation and delight because it feels like coming home, like talking to family, having a chance to speak about things that are very important to me with people who matter the most. But as with <coughs> all families, we sometimes find it difficult to deal constructively with the genuine differences between us and to recognize that unity does not require that we be identical to each other. Speaking about the influence of homophobia uh, on Black women, on uh, otherwise progressive Black women. She worked hard to pull apart the assumption that sameness was a prerequisite 
for unity. And 20 years after her death, we rely, we continue to rely on her incidents, whether we acknowledge them or not. We continue to rely on her insights whenever we attempt to imagine and organize radical movements that bring together people across racial, gender, sexual, national borders. And of course, there are important feminist ideas which assist us in our research and our activism that would have been unimaginable without the contributions of our group. Uh, and this notion of the creative power of difference uh, is, is one of them. Western cultures have had a hard time allowing difference to do its work. In order to be acceptable, it has to be capable of integration, incorporation, homogenization. This logic has helped to bolster not only homophobia, but racism of many sorts, anti-indigenous racism, anti-black, anti-Latino, anti-Asian, anti-Muslim. In another essay, which is uh, included um, the collection Sister Outsider, that is called Age, Class, Age, Race, Class, and Sex. Uh, you know, it's interesting that age is kind of fallen she she wrote the need for unity is often misnamed as a need for homogeneity the need for unity is often misnamed as a need for homogeneity it is often assumed that diversity is equivalent to the end of racism. And somehow or another, we sought to name the process of moving toward justice. Uh, and it seems that once the word diversity entered into the frame, it kind of colonized everything else. And all we talk about now is diversity. <laughs> And sometimes it means integrate different looking people into a process that remains the same. It's work difference that does not make a difference. This is why diversity was so quickly taken up as a corporate strategy. Don't reorganize the exploitative character of capitalist production. Just make sure that more black people, more women, more Latinos, et cetera, can actually profit from the master's tools. Never dismantle the master's house. So. Andrew Lord insists that, quote, difference must be not merely tolerated, but seen as a fun of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialect. Difference must be not merely tolerated, but seen as a fun of necessary polarities between which our creativity can spark like a dialect. She goes on to emphasize what she calls an interdependency of different strengths acknowledged and and this interdependency of different strengths can help generate new ways of, and so she urges us to grasp the notion of, of, of a created potential of difference rather than a destructive potential of difference see insistence on interdependency instead of hierarchy and the idea of uncharted worlds, uncharted worlds, new ways of being that remain, you know, all of these ideas remain absolutely essential to radical thought and action in the 21st century. The notion of difference as generative. I 
I choose the earth. We choose the earth <clears throat> and the edge of each other's battles. The war is the same. If we lose, someday women's blood will congeal on a dead planet. That if we win, if we win, there is no telling. All right, y'all. That was Audrey Lord. Let me know in the comments what your favorite poem from her is. And make sure you hit that like button, share, and subscribe if you haven't already. See you next video. Peace.